Hello and welcome to the Virtual American Library in Paris. I'm Alice McCrum, Head of All Cultural Programming at the American Library. Um, it's, I'm delighted to see all of you this evening and if I were in person I would ask you to raise your hand and say is anyone here for the first time but since we're online I would say the same thing. Maybe in the chat you can write is this your first time joining us and if so uh, where are you joining us from and regardless where are you joining us from we are curious. Um, tonight I'm delighted to be in conversation hosting poet, essayist, author and cultural critic Lewis Hyde to discuss this fantastic book, A Primer for Forgetting, Getting Past the Past, first published by Brass, Strauss and Giroux in 2019. Um, for anyone who is new uh, and for those who are returning, a reminder that after about 40 to 45 minutes, we'll open up to your audience questions. So if at any point you have a question or a comment for Lewis, um, do not hesitate to put it in the chat. And secondly, uh, both Lewis and I are looking out to a screen of um, no videos, <laughs> which I can understand perhaps if you're making supper or um, doing an activity, you are listening to this as a kind of podcast. But if you are in fact sitting in front of your computer, it really makes a difference for us and for all of you to see each other um, and see faces at the end of your Zooms. So I encourage you to turn on your videos. And in the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, so you start, Lewis, um, from a place of curiosity. That's where the subject of this book begins. And you begin with a, a kind of quote, or I suppose the quote um, invigorates your curiosity. And the quote is, oral societies keep themselves in equilibrium by sloughing off memories which no longer have present relevance. And so right from the beginning, we have these two main through lines which really find their way through the book. On the one hand, we have the sloughing off, the letting go, the shedding, the forgetting. And on the other, we have uh, remembering, preserving, noting and recording. And before we dive into this very rich content on the one hand of forgetting and the one hand of remembering, um, you also note in the beginning section that the book turned out to be an experiment both in form and in thought. And certainly what immediately strikes the reader, what struck me is the experimental form. Um, and so I thought as a way to start, maybe you could speak to this, this form. Um, how did you come up with it? Um, and how did it affect the writing process and the book itself? So the form is episodic. It, the book is made of many short pieces, <clears throat> often without uh, obvious sequence, but sometimes there is a bit of a story that unfolds. And um, uh, first of all, I found it fun to do. I guess I mentioned in the introduction of the book that I've written other books which have long, complicated arguments and are sort of defenses of some idea. So I have a book called The Gift, which is a defense of the idea that works of art are not necessarily commodities, don't belong in the market economy. And, you know, after 300 pages, I tried to make that clear. So it was a pleasure and release to me to um, gather fragments and not worry so much about how to build the argument. But that also means that I thought the form <clears throat> allows the reader more freedom to uh, make an argument for herself or himself. Uh, you know, this always happens anyway when you read a book. <clears throat> your mind drifts in certain ways. Some things stick in the mind, some don't. And so this really invites that kind of um, paying attention, but allowing uh, allowing your own mind to, to come to conclusions that the author's not necessarily trying to push. Um, so it was more fun to write <laughs> than a long argument. Uh, and um, I, I've been thinking that I might, if there's a second edition, declare what ideas I ended up discovering in this work, but the book uh, tries not to be too declarative. Yeah, I think certainly um, there are kind of refrains um, throughout the book, certain preoccupations, certainly certain theorists, so notably um, George Luis Borges, Ralph Waldo Emerson, William James, they come back quite a lot. Um, and just to kind of highlight what you just said, I, I thought you put it so well in this intro, in this introduction, or rather what this is, as you called it. Um, 
You write, I found myself weary of argument, tired of striving for mastery, of marshalling the evidence, of drilling down to bedrock to anchor every claim. What a relief to make a book whose free associations are happily foregrounded. Um, so drawing on citations, aphorisms. I'm losing your Sorry. Oh, there you are. Okay. I didn't know why uh, I'm losing your voice, whether it's on yeah, I'll, or... I'll speak up and I'll, I'll move in. Um, so drawing on citations, aphorisms, anecdotes, stories, reflections, as well as images and works of art, the book is, as you put it, a prose collage. And yet there is some kind of order to this collage, to this free association. Um, you break it into four notebooks, which I, as you talk about in the beginning, you kind of kept four notebooks and you put um, different thoughts and different materials, kind of like a, like a magpie. Um, finding glittery citations in the street um, into these four areas. Can you talk about these four main organizing principles? So myths, <clears throat> of nation and creation, um, how did you come up with them? And, um, and yeah, why these four? <laughs> so at a certain point, I had to uh, admit that my pile of uh, episodes <clears throat> needed some kind of order. And I literally uh, made little uh, note cards representing each of the many things I had and tried to try to figure out what patterns there were. And um, so, yes, uh, the first section is called myth. And there are many, I'll just say a bit about each one, each section. <clears throat> there are many myths that deal with remembering and forgetting. Uh, in Greek mythology, famously, Mnemosyne is the mother of the muses. But she's also, um, she helps, uh, as she inspires the bard to sing, the bard helps us forget our weariness and disenchantment of the present moment. So there's always a mix of memory and forgetting in that story. Or another one that's found all over the world is the idea that before we are born, the human soul travels in some other spirit world and knows everything, knows all there is to know. And then, sadly, to be born is to forget. Um, that's found in many places in China and Africa and in Greek mythology. And, uh, and in, a, in a way, it speaks to, it suggests that uh, if you, any new life can only begin if there's forgetting involved. Uh, so if you don't take it literally, it's not really about birth, it's about rebirth, about what it is to to wake up freshly. So there's a whole section on mythology. And then there's a section called self. Um, you know, the, the, the seed for that is a remark from a Buddhist sage named Dogen. And Dogen says, when you study the Buddha way, you study the self. And to study the self is to forget the self. And if you forget the self, then, <laughs> then the world opens up in some way. So uh, self-forgetfulness is uh, one of the key through lines. And of interest to me is that, that line from Dogen says it's not just stupid self-forgetfulness, a, it's a practice. You study the self to forget the self. There's, there's a process of some kind. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, and maybe, uh, you know, the easy place where people now think about forgetfulness and why it might be valuable is matters of trauma and uh so how do you if, if you've been truly traumatized part of the problem of it is the unforgettable and things that cannot be forget forgotten are a curse this is all through Jorge Luis Borges his work um so how do you work through something uh any kind of trauma so as to put it and one of the stories that's in that section is about a civil rights case in the United States where um, two young black men were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. And much later, one of the brothers of one of the murdered boys not only brings one of the Klansmen to justice, but tries to figure out how to forgive him. It's a complicated and moving story. And again, it's about self. There's a, there's a work this man was doing around the trauma of his brother's death. And then the third section. Can, can, I, can I jump in? Yes, I we are, we are going to get to these. I, I, I've broken up um, my questions based on kind of. Okay. So I, I want to. Yes. We can stay, 
And we can also say it's, you know, it's a kind of preview of what's coming. So the final two are nation and creation. Um, and maybe we can start maybe more locally and historically and then open up to these enormous questions and topics that you broach in the second half of the book. Um, particularly in myth, um, you talked about these kind of foundational myths about, about birth and rebirth. Um, but also what struck me in this discussion was the simultaneous discussions about forgetting, but also the birth of the so-called art of memory, memory art, which you write was to dominate European rhetoric and religious speculation for centuries to come. I pulled this book from our stacks. This is uh, Francis Yates's The Art of Memory. Yes. Um, can you tell yes. us about the history of memory art and how does it relate <laughs> to, briefly, how does it relate to the art of forgetting? Um, so this, is a popular topic in the academy uh, that in, in both Greece and Rome, we're talking about oral societies where people might give an oration and, you know, they may have had writing, but but many people didn't. And so how do you remember? How does any oral society remember what it needs to remember? And um, so rhetoricians developed arts of memory, methods of doing this, the famous one being the, the memory palace. You imagine a, a, a big house with many rooms and you put each of the points of your discourse into a room and you you do something memorable in the room like you put a bloody pig's head <laughs> and that you know, reminds you of your topic which somehow relates to that um so uh there's a lot of work on this and of course you can all these things you can invert so i began to think there should be arts of forgetting as well um and uh, no wonder more would you like to know about this? I mean, the whole book in a way is about the art of forgetting. And you will talk also about, it's lovely, the art of forgetting and also an altar to oblivion. Um, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a, you know, there's a famous story about uh, the Greek Civil War, uh, um, Athenians against Athenians and when it finally comes to the flows, I think an altar to oblivion is erected uh, in the Erechtheon and the, the Pantheon, in the um, uh, Acropolis. Um, and uh, somebody once wrote about the Irish Civil Wars, we should make an altar to oblivion and forget where we put it. So um, in many kinds of trauma, you would like somehow to be able to worship forgetfulness rather than memory of the past. And I think the, uh, thank you. <laughs> and that is, I mean, as we're, as you're discovering everyone on the Zoom, um, each section is so rich. And I, in the interest of time, I've really had to pull out, I think the the things that struck me, but certainly um, as Lewis said at the beginning, what struck, strike, strikes me, struck me certainly uh, would be different for you. Um, but I do think it's important because you spend time on this, um, talking about the etymologies of various words. The most important one, of course, being forget. Um, can you tell people on the call um, the etymologies of forget in Old High German and in Greek, and what can they reveal about forgetting as we understand it today? So um, I'll have to do this from memory, as it were. Uh, forget is um, a kind of letting go. Uh, it, forgetting, the, the, built into that word is the sense of releasing, the, opening your hand, letting things go. Um, and uh, so you could say it, it means loosening the hand of thought. Uh, and um, in Greek, the word lethe is the word for forgetting. And curiously enough, elethe, elethia, is the word for truth, which is the unforgetting. Um, and do you remember what page that's on? I'll actually read a little bit. For Lethe or for... Um... Yeah, Lethe. Okay, hold on, hold on. Yes. Uh, see, now we're, now we're both forgetting. <laughs> yeah, I'll find it in a second here. Part of the... Um, part of the importance of it, see. <laughs> uh... Yes, I've got it. Oh, um... yeah, 41, 41. Well, here's the thing about lethe. Forgetfulness in Greek is lethe. In return, 
in turn related to a phrase that means I escape notice I am hidden from ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European uh, root meaning to hide. Uh, the primitive or negative form of this is alethe or alethia, the Greek word for truth. Mm. In terms of mental life, all that is available to the mind is alethia. What is not available is for some reason covered, uh, concealed or hidden. Mm -hmm. Just to say one more thing about this. Um, I began to think also, you know, the, the the business of trying to find truth, all truth that would be an uncovering, I'm taking something out of hiding, um, as if the world itself and the meaning of the world is hidden. Mm -hmm. And we as truth seekers have to do the work of unhiding it. Uh, but the default state is that it's been, it's been forgotten, it's been hidden, and mm -hmm. needs to be uncovered again. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, maybe we can, we can think about that thought in relation, um, to the self, which is the second notebook, which, um, you preface as a perfectly useless <laughs> concentration. Um, you speak quite- yeah, cut out again. I sorry. Um, I was you're, just you're, yeah. saying ahead. we could, we can maybe put this thought that you've just saying about the kind of uncovering of truth in relation to the second notebook, that of self. Um, in which you describe your own memories and accounts of memories. Um, you title them tribal scars. Can you talk about your decision to include these memories, to talk about um, your, and at one moment you say preparing for my own dementia, in the, at the beginning you talk about your mother's old age dementia. Um, I suppose just the personal relationship that you have to this project of um, getting past the past or forgetting. So there are two parts of that. So yes, as with many of us, um, my my mother had a dementia at the end of her life, and my book is not a celebration of dementia. Uh, you know, this is the the grief. You know, it's a kind of early death, and um, so I suppose in a way it's a an attempt to as when when one gets older, one begins to have try to have a relationship to death. That's uh, something other than terror. Uh, so these days we have to have some relationship to our own forgetting. Um, so that's a kind of through line, a, a darker thread in the book. And then um, as for the more personal stuff, uh, going back to the Dogen thing about study the self to forget the self, uh, I do something with the word trauma. The word trauma actually in Greek uh, means wound. And so mostly nowadays we mean the kind of wound that is truly difficult to repair mentally or physically. Those are the traumatic events. That, but if you, if you just say wound, then there's clearly a, um, a range, you know, a little nick on your fingers, a wound. And I believe that part of growing up and being civilized is to have your culture uh, scar you, <laughs> wound you slightly with all of the things it demands with the, uh, the rules of the game. And uh, so in part of, of maturing and part of spiritual life is to recognize the degree that that's a cultural fiction. And it may be very serviceable and needed. It's not that you can't, you have to do this. But at the same time, there's a kind of freedom that comes from realizing that the things your parents told you were absolutely true turn out to be fungible at least. Um, so then I spent some time on, you know, I came from a family where uh, being smart was the most important thing. So you naturally, if you felt like a dummy, you tried to keep that hidden. Um, where being competent in the physical world uh, was important. So if you were a klutz, you kind of, so, so these are all my own tribal scars, which I offer up <laughs> in a somewhat self-involved way. But um, so, uh, yeah, there, there's parts, the book is not about me, but there are parts of the book that um, the foreground, both family stuff and, and my own sense of the work of spiritual life related to forgetting. Yeah, there's this lovely, um, you point out in this moment, you describe one of these tribal skulls, one of these moments where you find yourself, I think you put your it- Your voice dropped out again. Repeating, repeating the lines of um, sure. family member, 
And you point out at the end of this section that when you perform yourself, that's forgettable and rightly so, the actions of the unself, conscious self, leave no necessary mark on memory. By contrast, when you perform what is expected of you, that is what you remember. Can you talk about this very subtle but really powerful distinction I found? Yeah, I have a story about, um, well, many stories, but I have one more memory. From, I was a child, maybe 10 years old, and my mother asked me if she should cut her hair. <laughs> and I had no opinion about this, but I realized she wanted to cut her hair. So I said, yes, you should cut your hair. Um, and so why do I remember that? Uh, I mean, there are many things you remember for many different reasons, but in this case, I think it's because I was in script. I was called to to be a play a role in her script. I wasn't being myself, and um, uh, so I have many memories, several memories from childhood of that of being uh, dragged into somebody else's <laughs> drama and and dutifully performing my role. Um, but I, I do think that actually the unself kind, you know, a lot of play is is just forgettable. You. Uh, you're yourself alone having a good time and and later <laughs> you don't remember i mean i took a walk this morning around a pond here in cambridge massachusetts and i realized that you know i was daydreaming thinking and i realized you know i have no idea what i was thinking about um no, i could have taken a notebook and made notes but so that's the distinction uh playing a role or just playing yeah and there's another distinction um I hope this isn't too specific because it's I'm citing a specific theorist here. Um, you cite Svetlana Boim, who who makes the distinction between reflective nostalgia and restorative nostalgia um, that she uses to describe uh, Navikov's Vladimir Navikov's memoir Speak Memory. Um, can you make this distinction for us? Because I, I I found it striking. I had never encountered it before, especially as we think about how to maybe be nostalgic for our own past. What's the difference between reflective nostalgia, restorative nostalgia? So if I remember, restorative nostalgia tries to recreate the past. Um, if something you loved in the past and you were really intent on bringing it back and reinstating it. Um, reflective nostalgia realizes that that's impossible. Uh, it isn't that you don't feel the loss of the past and affection for the past. But there's a kind of almost amused um, detachment from it. And um, uh, you know, Nabokov in his book Speak Memory goes to some pains to say, try to say this is not nostalgic in the sense that he would like to reinstate the aristocratic youth that he had, uh, the money and the privilege and the summers at Vara. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's it's amused and playful and um, emotional revisiting to the past. Restorative nostalgia um, in this telling is actually kind of dangerous because uh, um, it, it's it's the "Make America Great Again" uh, slogan, in which there's some not only an image of the past, but you're going to bring it back. You're going to clean the statues and and uh, uh, and make everybody go back into the roles that they had in the past. And of course it can't happen. So therefore you become violent and put the people who won't behave into prison and uh, kill the others. So uh, <clears throat> it's a useful distinction about how we, um, how we mourn and work through the mourning of the loss of the past, which is always slipping away. Yeah, and I, I wanted to um, end because because the time is slipping away <laughs> this the self section here because i think it very nicely um sets up our, the, the discussion of nature nationhood and how one on a personal level mourns and reckons with the past of course has huge as you just mentioned ramifications for what that looks like um in groups larger groups um before we move to nationhood and uh creativity um you cite in the book Adam Phillips, uh, and you also at the beginning you said that you know you wanted the form of this book would allow for a certain kind of slipperiness of, of the reading experience that people would certainly remember or forget different things. 
Um, and I think in the book, I'm remembering <laughs> that you said that um, you couldn't quite remember why uh, one of Phillips's book had an effect on you, but you just remembered that it did. Um, and here you cite Phillips who writes, people come for psychoanalytic treatment because they are remembering in a way that does not free them to forget. And I think this is one of another through line in the book, a kind of informal through line, which is that if someone came to you, Lewis, and maybe they have now that you've written it, and they say, um, how can I open the hand of thought? How can I forget? And it seems to me several things come up. There's psychoanalysis. Uh, you talk about assigning symbols to mark the memory of something. There's self-study, as we've talked about. There's the creation of art. There's motion as opposed to fixity. And then humorously, you cite painter Bryce Marden, who says, use a long stick. Um, can you talk about the various tools of forgetting that you bring? I've mentioned some of them. Maybe that's all of them. But <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm so pleased to have you as a reader. <laughs> Alice, um, that's a wonderful list. Um, so I'll just say two. I mean, one is, again, um, so Dogen Zenji has a program. And this is a uh, meditation practice. And uh, simply put, in meditation practice, partly what you do is to watch how things arise in the mind and then step back from them. And, you know, there's a kind of what I call free forgetting. It's not that you cannot call the past to mind. It's that you're free to do it or not. And... Um, so that Adam Phillips line has that in it. Uh, people who remember in a way that doesn't allow them to forget. So it isn't that you become amnesia, you become uh, playful and free. Um, so there's that. There are others. The one I would mention that leads us into this nation business is, um, you know, one thing I do is, um, I have these several stories. One is about the civil rights murder in the United States, but another is, I, I, I Recall, I go through some of what they did in the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Program in South Africa. So what I say is that there's a sequence of events which might have to happen before a nation or a group could forget. And the first is um, justice. Uh, you know, bring the criminals to justice. <laughs> and um, no, sorry, the first is truth. You have to know what happened. Um, and that often is very hard to do in large groups. <clears throat> Second is justice. The third is what I call proper burial, where somehow what's happened needs to be honored and laid to rest. Um, only then you might begin to get apology. That would be useful. Or, rec or recompense, uh, reparations of some kind. Um, and at the very end, perhaps forgiveness. <laughs> but, um, and it's almost, there are very few cases in which you get that sequence, but that would be the goal. Yeah, so, I mean, this this is, I get that kind of goes to the nationhood, um, which we're going to get to momentarily. I also want to think about it in terms of um, just the, a person, you know, a person we've talked about trauma, you know, this idea of a wound, it's a deep impression in somebody's life or memory. Um, maybe you can talk about, I thought this might be related somehow, you, you have this lovely um, description of how you write a poem. <laughs> um, and it's called Revision by Forgetting. Maybe you can talk about the process of how you write a poem, because um, I also think it relates, that also relates to the creativity question. Um, and I think just before you maybe do that, if you wouldn't mind, I wanted to also make the point before we move to creativity nationhood that um, it seems to me, uh, that it's very hard, and this is, I think, why you, in part, you possibly wrote the book, it's very hard in the 21st century um, to forget with the internet that never forgets, with social media that is very much in the business of extolling the self rather than forgetting the self. Um, and even in literature, you know, with the prevalence and reign of autofiction, it's self, self, self all the time. <laughs> memory, memory, memory. Um, so... Maybe as a, as a kind of counterpoint to that, if you talk about the process of, of how you write poetry and also any thoughts about how, how it's just increasingly difficult to um, open the hand of thought, let's say. Oh, well, I just tell a little story that, um, so it's about trusting forgetfulness as a creative force. <clears throat> so the simple process is to write a poem and then wait a few days and then try to write it from memory. And to trust that what's what stays in memory is is the poem, 
and what drops away might as well drop away, or at least use that as a tool to uh, to interrogate what works and what doesn't work in the poem. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's a simple process, but it works for me. Um, and and does it strike you? I mean, this idea of trusting yourself, trusting your memory in relation to a force like the internet or social media platforms and the kind of incessant recording of everything and, and the focus on the nitty gritty details as opposed to a looser, more generous, more kind of fluid um, encounter with people, with ideas, with books. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, to <laughs> So yes, um, I mean, in the internet communities uh, are sometimes much involved in the right to be forgotten. Uh, the, the, the fact that the internet and archives now remember everything and have a record of everything can be accessed. To say briefly uh, earlier, there was a period in the Middle Ages when writing began to dominate uh, how people kept land records and so forth. and. Um, before that, if there was a court case, one way that it was adjudicated was to get the elders of the group together and, and rely on human memory. Uh, um, you know, time immemorial refers to the, the time that nobody can remember. And so you would only deal with time immemorial. Uh, once you have written records, you have to have some way of uh, reinstituting immemoriality, uh, some way of officially getting rid of the past. And so this was the invention of statutes of limitation. Statutes of limitation are an artifice of the law, which counteracts the artifice of writing. Um, so now we have the artifice of the internet, and we are in, in the infancy days of trying to figure out what the artifice of forgetting is to help us not have the unforgettable swamp us. Yeah, and even if we go further back, which you do in the book, before the Middle Ages, of course, in ancient Greece, um, Socrates was was really, uh, again, you know, these were oral societies, and the idea of writing something down was completely um, horrible <laughs> for him. Yeah, there's a story in, in Plato uh, that, that seems to be against writing, because writing uh, erases the need for oral memory. Um, okay, let's go to the nation, nationhood, the nation. Um, as uh, so, as you as you point out, and as we've been talking about, um, as nations, as groups, as institutions, the stakes are very high. Um, whether it's make America great again or kind of Hindu nationalism that we're seeing in India, the stakes are very high, and they're in the news all the time. Um, indeed, your opening aphorism for nation is. One of the opening aphorisms is the unforgotten, the destroyer of nations. Um, and I was, you know, I read the news. I try to read the news every day. And today's Guardian um, has the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is in the UK in Cambridge, exploring founders slavery, links with slavery of the founders. Uh, we recently hosted a conversation at the library about the question of what is to be done with non-European art and European um, Museums. I mean, there are just so many questions about what is our relationship to to very difficult um, historical events and processes. Um, and I wonder how these these questions and these conversations are becoming more clamorous. Lewis, you maybe your thoughts about what you wrote have evolved, or you've turned to the book as a way to navigate and understand these questions. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit to that. I mean, I should say, you know, this is not a book against remembering, and um, historical memory is very important. And in my country, the memory of slavery needs to be interrogated constantly. So um, the question, you know, I, the beginning quote for me in, in this section was from this guy, Ernest Renan, a Frenchman in the 19th century, who was thinking about what makes a nation. He says, uh, the essence of a nation is that all of its individuals have many things in common, and also that everyone has forgotten many things. And when you look closely at the, uh, his essay, what, what he thinks people have forgotten, basically, are the religious wars um, of early France, where, where Christians were killing Christians. 
you know, Protestants murdering Catholics, Catholics murdering Protestants, sects murdering people in another sect. Um, and this kind of, of religious discord, um, he felt, uh, <laughs> inhibited France from becoming France. He says, today, people in France don't think of themselves in those um, uh, tribal terms. And, um, uh, you know, in our country, uh, part of the founding idea of the United States was to separate the state from the church. And I think it came out of the same kind of intuition that as soon as you have a state church, uh, every other church is going to be at odds with it, and you're going to have uh, the seeds of civil war constantly present. So, um, uh, or, it, you know, I, I do a thing about uh, Kosovo, the breakup of Yugoslavia into its into its nationalist sects and the kind of violence that that um, that, that erupted, and, and the way that it erupted because um, people invoked the memory of the past, uh, which was the memory of of uh, religious difference. So, um, you know, this this is, these are places where memory is is not useful, where it, it simply divides people. Um, and in this country also, you know, the memory of racial difference is constantly in play and people know how to use it as a way of, um, you know, enraging their followers. So this is, I guess I have two questions to follow up on this. One is, um, given that you spend a lot of time with this subject, how would you maybe reframe the way that some of these conversations are happening? In other words, what are people getting right when they talk about forgetting and memory and possibly why are they um, going wrong and maybe one obvious place is these conversations should not be happening online <laughs> but maybe there are other examples that you see you know like like me like others you're reading the news and you think this is just this is this is you're setting yourself up for more violence more trauma where that's a cyclical there's not there's no relief there's no release um yeah um I'm looking toward the end of this book. Um, and many people are working on this. Of, um, you know, in in Israel and Palestine, you know, there are people working on how to how to find ways for people to to meet together and defuse their tensions. This goes on in this country. Um, I end up interested. There's an American. Uh, psychoanalyst named uh, Rami Wolfman, and um, he, he's worked with Arabs and Israelis, Serbs and Bosniaks, Turks and Greeks, Estonians and Russia, and he has a list at the end of one of his books, um, a set of questions that his work gives rise to. How can the symbols of chosen trauma, the chosen trauma is you take some horrible thing from the past and you get everybody to remember it and think about it, and then get all exercised about how bad the other the ending was, how can the symbols of chosen trauma be made dormant so that they no longer inflame? How can group memories adaptively mourn so that their losses no longer give rise to anger, anger, humiliation, and desire for revenge? How can preoccupation with minor differences between neighbors become playful? I like that. Um, you know, sometimes groups are able to joke about each other's differences. And how do you get to that stage instead of um, simple difference? How can major differences be accepted without being contaminated with racism? So I don't feel I'm an expert on this, but um, uh, you know there are many people who do this kind of work. I would say what they tried to do in South Africa is an example for the TRC. One thing to say about it was you could not get amnesty in South Africa without going through a process, which Included, you had to speak publicly about what, what you did. Your crime had to be political; it could be just be a grudge match against somebody. Your crime had to be proportional to the situation in which you acted, uh, and people, and you had to tell the truth. And many people were not given nasty. Now, the project was not perfect. There were many complaints to be made about it. But that's that's another way to start. And I mean, I also um, highlighted Vulcan's, one of the Vulcan's questions, um, and I, but I also thought you posed some really compelling ones too. You write or, and asked, um, 
Where is the politics or the spiritual teaching that might end such cycles? Is there any statecraft such that nations might forget their wounds? You know, that this idea of trauma. Um, so let's go, and I wanna encourage, I guess a lot of, some people are just watching or listening, but uh, please post questions or comments in the chat. Um, we have about 20 minutes. Uh, and so Lewis can answer them and I'll post them um, on your behalf. Um, maybe we can talk about creation. Uh, Lewis, that's the third, that's the fourth section of this book. Um, creation in all forms, in all senses of the word, poetry, prose, art, music. Um, what did you discover about memory and um, forgetting in different forms of art? And maybe how has it changed your creative process? I mean, you've already talked about how you write a poem, but maybe it's changed now how you write prose too. What did I learn? <laughs> um, oh, maybe what surprised you? Or what struck, what, um, what was unexpected about bringing this question of memory and forgetting to the process of creation? You know, maybe, maybe um, one thing I hadn't anticipated, this phrase free forgetting was not something I had thought of before I was writing this book. And um, uh, I got it, well, it came up when I was working through a, an essay somebody wrote, um, which described works of art that matter to us as works you can return to over and over again. And the second or third time you go back to them, you happily forget uh, some of what you knew before in order to see again something else. The, the example is uh, somebody listening to a symphony. And the first time you listen to the symphony, you may not, you wonder uh, what chord begins it. Is this the A minor? Is this a D minor? Is this a, a major chord? Um, and then by the end of it, you figure that out. Then you listen to it again and you know that very well. And so you can forget about that problem. But the other example was um, reading a Sherlock Holmes uh, mystery story. And um, the first time you read it, it's a mystery and you wait for Mr. Holmes to figure it out. But you actually go back to these stories and watch how they're made. Uh, and your interest is different. So in a way, um, in that case, the, the mystery that sometimes is posed in work of art uh, is what Alfred Hitchcock called a MacGuffin. Uh, it's a thing that keeps your attention focused, but in fact, the work of art is mysteriously going on around you without. <laughs> and um, uh, I began to think actually that all of life is a MacGuffin. <laughs> that all of my purposes, the things I think I must do this by tomorrow, I must do this this week, those are MacGuffins which keep me attentive and busy. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but again, in, in that is the idea of free forgetting is um, a kind of uh, sense that it's okay not to be the master of your memory and not to have everything present as you work, but to uh, let things come and go uh, as the mind dictates. Yeah, and I think this is to go back to our, our opening discussion about the art of memory and these idea of the memory palaces. I thought this was a nice um, point in relation to that discussion, because you um, you talk about the invention of moving pictures in 1917, and you write, question, how does one create a new thought for any object? Answer, move it around. And therein lies a problem with the place system, the old technique of artificial memory in which an image is committed to memory, <laughs> committed as if to prison by fixing it in a specific location. The whole apparatus is uh, freezes meaning, solidifies it, produces durable, fixed ideas, useful in the short term to be sure, but what happens to those ideas when they are in need of change? Um, so there's this really idea of kind of like disruption and motion. Um, and I was just thinking, because I was reading um, Natalia Ginsburg's The Little Virtues, and um, she has this wonderful passage in that book about how she said, she says that a lot of writers and essayists keep a kind of notebook where they they put their best ideas 
So, you know, you're walking down or you're walking around a pond and you have a great idea and you think, oh, yes, I'm going to use this in my next novel. And so you write it down in the book. And then later that day, you're having supper with a friend. And you think, oh, yes, I have a great idea. You put it in the book. And she says, this is wrong. And that that artists should immediately, as soon as an idea comes to them, they should use it because otherwise this notebook, which is basically saving the great ideas, ends up become, becoming a kind of mausoleum. <laughs> um, so I like that. I like that. Um, yeah. Actually, the, the, this business about the fixed idea, there's a wonderful phrase that analyst Pierre Genet uh, years ago says the work he was trying to do was the liquefaction of the fixed idea. That is, people come to him unable to get out of their own head, and you want to liquefy the, the fixed idea. Mm -hmm. um, or the example that, that led up to the piece you read was Marcel Duchamp putting a urinal in the museum as a work of art. And so he's just moving things from one context to another and showing the degree to which uh, the fixedness of contexts uh, determines how we read them and interpret them. And you can move them around and suddenly you have a different thing. There's, and, and that's related to um, this, this the kind of conversation with John Cage of hearing something for the first time or seeing something for the first time, which is to say, um, kind of the 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 best thing that can happen i suppose if you if you forget lots of things is that you have this like primal experience as an adult um and maybe that one of the points of art is to facilitate that kind of encounter um with an object with a sound with an image with yeah. words yeah yeah how to, how to cultivate what they call beginner's mind where uh somehow you go back to to the earliest exposure to something. Or again, with free forgetting, uh, new exposures could reveal new things. So it's not, um, you know, you want somehow to be both the adult and the child. <laughs> and maybe you can talk, um, and I would encourage, I, I guess everyone's just kind of, there's so much to think about. <laughs> so there are not many questions. Um, I have loads, I have many more, um, but we've talked about, um, freeing up the mind in terms in terms of kind of having this primal experience. And maybe you can talk about the importance of just being in presence and being in the present moment, because of course the future looms largely um, in the book too. You know, whether if, if we're not stuck in the past, then we're, we're projecting into the future, which isn't yet here, which is total speculation, which isn't real. Um, maybe you can talk about the importance of the, pr the present moment um, and being in that moment. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's all we have. Um, and this isn't to say that both memory and anticipation are not useful. They are. Um, but um, I guess the old idea is, is that um, only in the present can certain kinds of work be done. Um, if you find yourself imagining how you're going to get a PhD and you're really going to study hard and you're going to have new habits and, and not be the way you were in the past. It's all in the imagination. It's not something. So unless you can do it today, you're not doing it. Um, so uh, they dream about being a great poet. Or if you're walking around the pond putting things in a notebook but not writing poems, um, you know, again, it's an anticipation of a future event in which you'll write the great poem that includes this line. Um, so uh, the present is the cutting edge of all kinds of practice. Thank you. Um, I, sp I, I suppose the other, the other qu the questions that I would have uh, were also related to, um, I mentioned Borges, Emerson, um, who you, you read so widely um, to write this book and you read different in different kind of disciplines, history, philosophy, literature. Oh, you're, you're, you're okay. I, I'm just, I guess I'm asking about your process. Um, what was your kind of, what was the parameter of your search? <laughs> because you, you end up citing historians and poets and philosophers and visual artists. Um, and we can, there's this real sense in the book that you're, you're searching and you're ending up in all these different places. Um, I suppose, what was this very vast parameter? And at what point did you say, okay, I have enough material and now I'm gonna to begin to assemble it? Um, 
Well, at a certain point, you have to hand in your manuscript if you want to, <laughs> if you want to finish your book. Um, my process for this book and, and in general is to watch for what amuses and fascinates me um, and, and, and things I can understand. Um, uh, so sadly, I am not good at literary theory. Some of it I understand, some of it I just it doesn't amuse me and doesn't fascinate me. And um, I, I wish I had mastered Derrida, but I haven't. Um, and uh, this business of fascination, I mean, in terms of being a writer, what I look for are things that intrigue me, but they do not understand, or that will never give out. So I, so I could spend a couple of years you could spend a lifetime thinking about memory and forgetting. Um, or, uh, you know, I have an early book on trickster figures, the mythology of the trickster. I mean, that, that took me <laughs> maybe 10 years to write, but it was, uh, it, never, it never gave out on me. I never thought I had mastered the material. So um, I look for things that somehow uh, interest me. Uh, and I guess I, I I think if I really can watch for that and um, and also make it available, that it has to interest other people, or you know, there are, there will be other people who find it interesting. Um, so you want to if something bores you, you want to turn away. Occasionally, you have to pay attention anyway. But <laughs> and and maybe you can talk about um, your own practices of of forgetting and memory. Um, because I, as I mentioned, I made this kind of list and do you do this? Uh, are you meditating? Um, are you in, in analysis? <laughs> <laughs> did, the, did, did studying, you know, studying yourself in these, in these childhood memories, did you um, find that that kind of liberated a part of you that maybe wasn't before? Um, yeah. Did this, did writing this book have an effect on how you now remember and forget things? Do you think? Yeah, it does. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's uh, in fact writing the book is the practice, um, and, and the practice. You know, for me to say that I am looking for things that amuse me and, and fascinate me, it also means if something, if I forget something, I, you know, I take that as a sign that somehow it doesn't belong in in the thing I'm searching for. Uh, you know, you read an article and, and one idea is memorable to you, that's useful to know. Um, and then if you're forced to, to, if somehow things force themselves into your memory, which just bug you, then you need to do some kind of work. Um, and I, you know, I've done psychotherapy of one kind or another, I've done meditation practice of one kind or another, and um, both of them have been useful. Uh, but I guess uh, as a writer, my writing practice is, has learned from psychotherapy work and has learned from uh, spiritual work of different kinds. Um, and it probably I can't even say how it's in the work, but it's there. Yeah, I'm really glad that you bring this up because it reminds me of a question that I wanted to ask you, um, kind of related to how how does any, it's, I guess it's in the kind of self section, you know, how does one, uh, remember and forget because you noted as you do in the book that one of the ways in the in the kind of art of memory um one of the ways to really remember something is to make it very vivid you know to make it very horrifying as you said that you know to have blood have a severed head or something as part of the the mise-en-scene and I, it seems to me that another thing about the 21st century is that I guess particularly on the internet and on social media but in the news and maybe in the way that people speak um, our emotions, you know, the, our strong reactions are being so kind of manipulated and dragged around and we're, we're being solicited all the time. Um, do you find that kind of, I, I suppose, maybe it's not even a question more that I observe that kind of contemporary society, it's, it's harder to really remember and forget because just the kind of like our mental space um, is so subsumed <laughs> with information. Yeah. Um, well, so much of life is now mediated. <clears throat> um, I mean, I've been perplexed recently. You know, I listen to the news every night, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do if it's announced that 
you know, some train went off the track in Thailand and 50 people were killed. I, I don't know what, how this is supposed to operate in my consciousness. Um, you know, very distant, <laughs> distant, or I have a clipping in my house, a newspaper I found in the wall from 1885 that talks about an earthquake in Chile or something. Oh no, all these people are dead. I mean, the, the, so we have the distant, we have mediated distant trauma of all kinds constantly in front of us. Um, and uh, it, it's so different than, you know, direct witness is what produces physical reaction and true emotion. And um, for most of us are lucky not to have traumatic events that have this character. Um, but that's, again, you know, one of the things I hadn't thought about, I don't know why when I began this book, was the problem of the unforgettable. And, um, you know, in Greek mythology, the, the Furies are agents of the unforgettable. The crime has been committed and you cannot forget it. And the problem is how to get released from that. Um, and uh, what what is unforgettable somehow gets into your body. And, and, and so it tends not to be things you're read about, but in fact, things that you suffered directly. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, that, I mean, if there was- You know, more... in a way, <laughs> you know, you're asking for practical advice and I don't have any. <laughs> I will I'm, just, say, I'm just a writer. <laughs> I, will, I will say that if there was one aphorism that stuck with me, um, apart from live steep in history, but not in the past, was this image of the Furies bloated with the undigested past. I found that so kind of striking and shocking. Um, so I, for what it's worth, that's what, that's what <laughs> remember, if there was an aphorism that, that stayed in my mind. Um, we have a question from, oh, okay, two questions from Law, who says, can you talk about delight in memory, memories that aren't traumatic or nostalgic, but have a positive effect, affect or emotion associated, memory that's moved us and perhaps uh, even changed us for the better? Well, how nice to have them. <laughs> how wonderful. Um, and they should be treasured. Um, I guess the, the question is, um, to what degree do you make self out of these wonderful things that happened, these delights that you had in the past? And, um, and what will be the fate of the self you make out of these delights that you had in the past? Um, uh, happily, they will accompany you to the grave and, and delight your days uh, till the very end, but um, you know, I guess, I guess you know. Sometimes they get confused with pride. Uh, you know, you won a prize, and that delighted you, and you love to think back on the moment you won the prize. <clears throat> but now you've now you now you're a prize winner, <laughs> and what happens to the loser in you? The poor loser is now in the shadows. And, you know, needs needs some help. Um, so, uh, again, the forgetting of the self in, in the spiritual sense is uh, some sense of the fluidity of the self, realizing that uh, the self comes and goes in certain ways and is reconstituted, and, and keeping it fluid is uh, the claimed virtue of these spiritual practices. Thank you. Um... This is, I suppose, will be the final question from Emily Abbott, who says, to return to something that was discussed earlier, uh, as we continue to create new ways of remembering through technology, uh, as we have already had in the past with writing, and as Alice also underlines with talking about being constantly bombarded with information, how can we find new ways to forget? I think the question is, how can technology, these new tools of technology that we have, help us remember and help us forget? Well, I mean, there are two parts of this. One is uh, whether the internet communities themselves can begin to institute practices and laws and rules of the game that allow for for the erasure of digital records. Um, and then secondly, is uh, each individual 
on a daily basis. How do you, how, how does one um, relate to these things? And I mean, I, when I'm trying to write, I have a practice of, I mean, these days I will not look at the internet before noon, you know, it, and it's a simple kind of blockade um, to, to be in a different kind of mind uh, because the internet and these screens are addictive. Um, and uh, so I, I would say, you know, my aphorism for creative life is that you need a time and enclosure. And by enclosure, I mean, you need some kind of walls around what you're doing to keep all the other stuff out. And most of the internet is the other stuff. And you need some way to uh, put a circle around yourself and keep it out. Um, so private practice and community practice. Thank you. That's great. And actually, um, there's a novelist uh, in Paris. She's not here anymore, but she was here this year, um, who has a similar, I think she, and she's um, kind of closer to my generation. And she really noticed that her use of the internet was weighing on her practice. And she, I don't think she turns on any kind of internet until maybe two or 3 p.m. Um, so I think it's increasingly the case that people are thinking, oh, this technology has longer tentacles than we realized, and maybe the tentacles are more malign. <laughs> um, so, okay, so we're getting a lot of thank yous and, and um, thank you for the beautiful thoughts. And I've posted uh, the links to buy the book. Here it is, um, a primer for forgetting. And uh, these are the two links. And Emily will send you uh, a link also tomorrow. I cannot recommend this book uh, more highly. And we've really only just touched on the surface and it's been based on what struck me. So uh, you'll bring your own preoccupations to the book and it will be a very useful tool to navigating this, um, the choppy waters of the 21st century. 